Every week we release our messages in two different ways. There's a message only version of which this is, or you can watch the prayer, the music and the message version if you click on this button. Well, hello, everybody. It's wonderful to have you with us. I pray wherever you are that you are blessed. And I pray that this be a magnificent year for you. Well, in a couple of days time, it's my birthday. And that's right. My staff are saying I should tell everyone it's my birthday. And so I'm telling you all it's my birthday. Unfortunately, I'm getting older. I I wanted to go the other way, but I'm not. Well, I've decided this year that I was not making New Year's resolutions. You know why? Because the thing I've realised about New Year's resolutions in my life, I don't keep them. So many times I've decided to start a New Year's resolution and not done it. I remember every year for years, I used to always decide I was going to lose weight. And that was my big, big New Year's resolution. And and I remember one year, and I've told this story very often, I remember one year, it was about quarter past 12, and I'm standing in the kitchen and and I have... And I'm standing there with a bowl of ice cream. And I decided I was giving ice cream up. And I'm standing there in the kitchen and I'm about to, and, and it's quarter past 12. And, and all of a sudden, Rosemary walked in and she said, I thought you were giving up ice cream. I thought you were going to lose weight. I thought you were giving that up for your New Year's resolution. And I, and I remember I looked down and I saw the bowl of ice cream and I went, how did that get there? And Rosemary said to me, she said, I saw you come in. I saw you get the bowl, the spoon. I saw you go to the fridge and to load it up. And here you are about to eat it. And want to know something? I completely had done it subconsciously without thought. And I was only 15 minutes into the new year. So I've given up New Year's resolutions altogether. They don't seem to work for me. Have you ever decided to do something uh, that you knew was in your best interests? Have you ever decided to do something for someone you love and you knew it was in their best interests? Have you ever decided to do something for people around you and you thought this will really be good for them? And then you find you don't start it or, <laughs> or if you're like me, you don't finish it. Or, or am I the only one who does that? Uh, you know, so many of us start things and don't finish things well. We start out with all sorts of great intention, but we don't run to the end uh, and, and cross the finish line. Uh, did you think life would turn out like it has? Have you achieved all the things you were going to achieve to this point in your life in terms of your family, in terms of your career, in terms of the money that you have in the bank, in terms of your happiness, friendships? Uh, are you disappointed with yourself as a parent or happy? Uh, have you got the marriage that you wanted to have or not? Are you, have you achieved the results in the study that you were going to? Uh, are you bored at work or are you feeling really fulfilled? Because so many of us in so many areas of our life, we want change and we want deep change. We want things to be different than what they were, uh, what they are or have been. Uh, but yet so many of us avoid change because vo- uh, change is such a difficult um, uh, subject. So I thought in my life that because there are some areas in my life that I want to change and I want to continue to strive to be better at, I thought, well, I'm going to talk about this. And so I might be the only one that this is for, but I suspect it will be for many others. But this is what I'm thinking about my own life. And I don't want to suggest for a minute that life is bad, but I know that life can be better. Uh, the truth is we do want deep change. The truth is we do want to be more fulfilled. We do want to be happier. We do want to get more out of life. We do want our new year to start strong or maybe even another way of saying it, we do want our new year to start smart and we want to start in a, in a good way um, because it's always good to get off to a good beginning, isn't it? It's always to get ahead. Uh, you know, A solid beginning is the foundation of a great ending. If, if we can go all the way to the end. I've talked to many businesses and many of them say at the beginning of the year when our year begins, it's great to see early results to, and, then, and to compare those results to previous year's results. And if you can be ahead, isn't it's just so smart and it's such, uh, it puts you in such a strong place. Now, I'm not a motivational speaker. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a think positive type of person and your future will be great. Um, I'm certainly not a you can do it kind of person in my life. I'm someone who, who has learned because I've read the scriptures to take the scriptures and to ask the scriptures, this living book, this living book to speak to me and to guide my future and to guide my life. And, and I have found this works more than New Year's resolutions work. Um, And so I'm going to take a passage of scripture and I'm going to try and bring that to life today and allow it to to speak to us. And and I'm going to read a long story 
Um, well, I'm going to ring bits of the long story. And I'm going to let you read uh, the longer story uh, because we want to start well and we want to start smart. Well, the story I want to tell is the story of the beginning of Mo- much of Moses' early life from Exodus chapter 2 and Exodus chapter 3. And, and here we are. We know that the people of Israel, the people of Israel uh, have gone into Egypt and, and, and they go into Egypt and time goes by and the king dies and their origins of how they came to be in Egypt gets forgotten. And then, and then what we find is that the Egyptians begin to oppress the people of Israel. They become slaves uh, in the land. And, 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 the king, and the new king of Israel, uh, of king of Egypt, he, he sees that they are becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. And so determines that and gets fearful that they, want, they may one day overthrow the people of Egypt. And so what he does is he begins to oppress them with harder labour and harder labour and harder labour. Um, and then even they become so fearful that they be, may become so, uh, so great in numbers. And because they're the ones doing all the physical work, they're strong. He directs the midwives of the people of Israel that when little boys are born, that they are to be thrown into the Nile, that they are to be killed. And that way, keep the Egyptians strong, but the people of Israel weak. We read at the beginning of Hebrews chapter, uh, sorry, of, of Exodus chapter of two, that the Hebrew people um, uh, are so severely in trouble and, and in difficulty. Well, there's this little boy whose name is Moses. Well, a little baby, to be honest. He's, he's born uh, to a Levite woman. And she doesn't want to see her son killed. So she comes up with a plan. She puts him into a basket. She goes down to where the princesses of Egypt uh, are bathing and she floats him down the Nile River. And the scriptures tell us that one of the princesses opens the basket and sees this baby and she looks at him and goes, oh, how cute. Uh, doesn't use the word cute in scripture, but that's the inference that it is, is that, that she looks at this baby and she takes this baby and she takes the baby back to the palace. And little Moses is raised in the most powerful uh, place in the whole world. He's at the epitome of leadership. He sees it. He's, it's, it's all around him. He's in the palace, raised as, as, as one of the almost the princes of Egypt. And then one day he goes out and he sees, he sees uh, someone who is a Hebrew fighting another Hebrew and he gets in a fight and, um, and he gets in a fight with them. And, and before it gets known, he, it gets discovered that someone gets killed and that he, he realises that the only person who can put someone to death is the Egyptian pharaoh, the Egyptian king. And so he runs and at the age of 40, he, go, he leaves the palace and he runs and he ends up over the other side of the desert and he ends up being a shepherd looking after sheep. And so he goes from this palace to the pasture. This mighty man trained in leadership loses all of the position he has to go and spend time doing nothing but looking after sheep. And it is, and it is a crazy time in his life. Have have you ever noticed in your life, have you ever noticed in your life that sometimes God uses the sadnesses, the difficulties, the struggles of our lives to make us more prepared for the future history that we're going to have? That God uses the difficulties and the struggles in our life to be able to get us to the place where we can do greater things and better things in our life. Well, in the scriptures in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23, Exodus 2, verse 23, it says this. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. And out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up uh, to God. God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And God looked down upon the Israelites and God took notice of them. And God took notice of them. I think that's a fabulous passage and a fabulous few lines. God took notice of them. One of the things that we have seen and see through the scripture, certainly been part of my life, is that God takes notice. That in my life, in your life, God takes notice of where we are. And so in the beginning of Exodus chapter 3, 
God decides he's going to do something about these people who are oppressed. Now, whenever there's a difficulty to deal with uh, in, in the scriptures, what does God do? God always chooses a person. God says, I'm going to do something. And the way he chooses to do it is he chooses a person. And so one day, here's Moses after 40 years, having been in a palace, trained in leadership, that for the next 40 years, the scripture tells us he's standing there holding a staff, talking to sheep all day. That's what his life's become. And at the age of 80, God speaks to him. And so in Exodus chapter 3, I'm going to read down to, to Exodus chapter, tw- uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Uh, we read a fascinating story that is so powerful and has so many implications for your and for my life. Moses was keeping flock, the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. So here's Moses occupied in his job. He's looking after sheep. That's what his life has become. And all of a sudden there's a bush that's burning, but it's not burning up. And then what does he say in verse 3? Then Moses said, I must turn aside, look at this great sight and see why the bush is not turned up. So initially it gets his interest. But at this point in time, he doesn't know that it's God. Uh, He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then verse 3. Then Moses said, I must turn aside, look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. Now, this passage of scripture is a fabulous passage of scripture for this reason. And in my life, I've experienced the same thing. No, I haven't seen a burning bush not burning. But sometimes the things in my life that have gripped me, that, have, that I've found hard or difficult or I've not understood, when I've turned aside to look, it's been those times some, very often that I've heard the voice of God. Sometimes God is speaking to us and God is working in our lives. God is wanting to speak and guide our lives. And sometimes he gets our attention by the circumstances around us. And we look to the side and when we look, so often that's when the time that God comes and speaks. So here's Moses. He's just occupied in his everyday job. And all of a sudden God decides, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to talk to you now. So God sets up something that gets his attention. When he gets his attention, he turns aside and then God speaks to him and said, then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from my feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. When God speaks to us, it's a holy place. When God comes and talks into our life about our direction, about our future, about where we're going, it's a holy place. Verse 7, verse 6. He said further, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He, he, he sets up his identity, he, his credibility, and he says, this is my history. This is who the God I am of. And Moses hid his face for you as afraid to look at God. I want to know something. Isn't it true? Isn't it true that when you know the right thing, to, when you have those moments, when you stop and go, yeah, I, I, that you have that sense of conviction, you know, and that sense of I'm in the presence of something great. I'm, in the, I'm, there's, I'm unsettled within myself. That sometimes we really hide our face from the voice of God. Verse 7, then he said, I've obs- God says to him, and the Lord said, I've observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their suffering, and I've come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the ha- land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jezebites. The uh, cry of Israel, Israelite, of the Israelites has Uh, Now come to me. I've also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come. So God says, I've seen all these things and I'm going to fix it. And you kind of of hear Moses going, well, that's great. And then it says, verse 10. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. 
If, if God, here's God saying to me, I'm going to do all these things. And then all of a sudden what happens is God then turns it around and says, yeah, I've seen all these things. I'm going to do something about it and I'm sending you. That's my plan. How crazy is that? How many times when we want God to come and do something and God says, well, I'm going to get you to do it. Verse 11. But Moses says to God, because Moses objects, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the, and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I'll bless you. I will, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall return. You shall worship God on this mountain. So, he, so God says, yeah, I'm going to, I see the difficulty they're in. I'm going to fix it. My way of fixing it is I'm going to send you. And, and when it's all done, you're going to come back here and you're going to pray, pray to me in the spot where you are. Now, the story is exciting and the story is scary. Let's have a look at Moses' life just in summary. He's born at a time when Pharaoh had directed the midwives to kill, um, or kill because of politics and power. Um, he's, given up, he's given up by his mother. Uh, he lives in luxury, uh, only to find one day he gets in a fight, he kills someone, realises he, he shouldn't have done that, so he runs. He gets, find out, he gets found out when someone says, you're the one who killed someone. He runs away and, and he ends up looking after sheep. Imagine what it must have been like going from that beautiful palace, the most powerful place in the land, in the world, to all of a sudden being out on a hill looking after sheep. Um, and then God comes to him one day after he's been doing it for 40 years, standing there just looking after sheep, and God says, um, I'm going to get you to go back to Egypt, back to the place that you ran from, and you're going to get all of these people out of Egypt, all of the people of Israel. And by the way, they've been there for 430 years. By the way, they've forgotten their culture. By the way, they've forgotten to a large degree their history. They have, they have taken their values and they've seeped them in to the Egyptian value system. They've allowed their ways to seep into the thinking of the people. And... Uh, the whole Egyptian economy is based on them working in the way they are and I'm going to get you to get them out. You know, just a little easy task for you there, boy. Um, and so Moses is standing there looking at the burning bush and he says, well, I can't do that. Um, you know, I'm, and, and he looks for excuses. And if we read, this, the, read the passage, he goes on and he says things, who am I? Who am I that I should do this? And he, he comes up with in the end, he even stops and he says, well, I'm not a good communicator. I'm not a speaker. Moses looks for excuses. Can I ask you a question? Are there things right now as we begin 2021 that you need to change in your life but you're making excuses for? The, the kind of wife you are, husband you are, parent you are, the kind of uh, person who's in retirement seeking the way you're living, thinking, uh, you're a student, the way you, you're, are you making excuses for the way you're living? Um, he's, he, he's living a life that he's become accustomed to. Circumstances took him away from his dream, from the place he was, you could say. Circumstances took him out of the palace and now he's looking after sheep. That, was what, that wasn't the long-term plan, I'm sure, after 40 years. But he's living, he's just succumbed to the circumstances, right? And he's got a negative attitude. He sits there, he stops and he says, well, I was given up by my mother at birth. I was raised among a people who are not my own. I'm a murderer. I'm a runaway fugitive. I talk to sheep all day. How can you choose me to do this impossible thing? Uh, and now you want me to go to Pharaoh. You want me to say to him, let all the people go. Moses was allowing right now his history to affect his destiny. Moses was allowing his history to affect his, his destiny. Uh, he was raised to be a leader. He was raised to be used by God and yet... And yet he was allowing the circumstances that were around him right then to affect his destiny. There, there are some of you, your marriages are not great. And because you've got a history of your marriage being what your marriage has been and your history is dominating your destiny, it doesn't have to be that way. With God, it can change. Moses became a great leader once he dealt with once he dealt with the circumstance he was in and once he got to that place where he stopped and he said, and he began to see God at work. We began to see God at work. So I want to give you three things that you can do as to how you can start strong. I'm going to say them pretty quick because they are pretty simple. Then this is a great way to start smart. 
And as I said when I, at the very beginning, I'm talking to myself. I mean, you know, my life is not falling apart by any means, but I'm certainly in many areas of my life, there are some areas of my life I would really like to have a different destiny, a different future than where I am right now. And so I'm speaking a word to you that I would speak to me, that I would speak to me. Uh, number one is, is ways to start, is to look forward from the place of your history, to look forward from the place of your history. So exactly where you are, you can't change your past. You can't change what your marriage was, the things that have been said. You can't change the results you got because of your study. You can't change the results your business got. You can't change what they've been. And so looking from the place where you are, what does your future need to be? Maybe your business doesn't have the income in it that it has. Maybe your ministry doesn't have the income uh, for those in church work that, that you thought it would have. You either stand in the place of defeat You stand in the place of of just saying, well, we're going to do exactly the same thing we've done in the past and you'll get the same result that you've got in the past. Nothing will change. But if you allow where you've been and the strength of where you've been to be the, the thing that determines your future, you can change your life stepping forward. But you'll need to make you'll need to make some change. Your history can give you strength for the future. Your history. Our history can give us steps forward to be able to achieve our destiny because we have to change. We have to change. I was reading about a business recently that had gone through some very ter- a very terrible time with the coronavirus. They, they were in one particular industry, but because of coronavirus and they were in the event industry, but because events or public events in the place where they were were completely banned for months on end, it was either they wrapped up their business or they reinvented themselves, they retooled themselves, they found new markets for what their skill sets were and they came up with different products to be able to step forward into the future or they would have have been uh, defeated. Our past doesn't have to pilfer our success. It doesn't. Uh, You don't, you know, we don't don't have to allow uh, where we were born to dictate what our future is. We don't have to allow, allow the family we were born into to be the one that dictates how we see success or not. We don't have to allow the time we are living, the, the age that we are, to be, to be that which depletes who we are right now. Moses didn't choose his circumstance. He didn't choose to be born in an era where little baby boys were being killed. He didn't choose for his mother to sail him down the river. He didn't choose to live for 40 years in a, in a palace that was not his own people. He didn't choose to live for 40 years uh, looking after sheep. But that was his circumstance. And here he was, becomes one of the great leaders of all of human history because he didn't allow his, fu- his past to dictate his future, even though when it first came up, the opportunity and the doorway to a new thing was so frightening, was so scary. And when he looked at himself, he said, I lack so much ability and talent and gift. He didn't allow any of those obstacles to stand in the way of who he, uh, of who he was. See, see the, the Pharaoh directed the midwives to throw the little baby boys uh, uh, into the Nile River. And yet it was the Nile River that actually floated him to his future. He would never have been able to lead the people out of Egypt the way he did after 430 years and then turn them into a people and teach them culture and teach them and teach them and guide them and lead them. If he hadn't had those 40 years, God used his past in order to set him up for his future. Our past can be the very thing that sets up our future. Even if all it does is doesn't teach us new skill, but teaches us the resolve to get up again, to get up again. When I first started in ministry, I worked in I worked in jobs that had nothing to do with church work. And yet now I often laugh and Rosemary and I often laugh that the very things that when I was wanting to do church work, but those doors were not open to me. And I ended up working in other work, how those jobs have come over and over and over again, teaching me skills and disciplines because God had a bigger plan. What I thought when I thought I had been forgotten, God had not forgotten me. God was preparing me for a future that I was going to walk that I did not see and I did not know. 
Have you ever considered that the, that, the, that the very vehicle that has prevented you and the struggles that you have may be the very vehicles that carry you to the future that you'll have in terms of your attitude, in terms of your heart and in terms of who you can be? That they were the very things that prevented you in the past will, will turn your marriage to greatness will make you a phenomenal mum and dad, make you a successful business person, give you a great career in sport or, or in business, affect your relationships, will allow you to achieve your unique purpose. The second way that we can, be, we can start strong in this year is to realise we're not alone. We're not alone, that God is with us, that God is with each and every one of us. If we would close our eyes, centre our heart, and we would call to God, God is with us, guiding us and leading us. He is a prayer away. He is a thought away from us all of the time, and he holds us in the palm of his hands all of the time. That, uh, th- there's also, we are not alone. There are people that we can reach out to. When I was starting in, in, the, in a new kind of area of ministry, I was really interested in not just doing church the way it had been done. I was really interested in reaching people who were distant from church. I was interested in finding out new ways to communicate things. Um, I went to people that I didn't know. I went to the business world. I went, to, I went and talked to all kinds of ministry people, church people that wouldn't have talked to a kid like me when I was starting out. And I went to them and I asked them, can I come and talk with you? Can you, can you share with me? And I was always shocked by how generous people were to me. Um, I, I've also learned that we are not alone because there are other people with different talents who will come alongside us. When, when Moses comes along and says, I can't speak, I can't speak, I can't speak, it seems that that was a real confidence issue because the interesting thing was God says to him, well, there's Aaron, he's a good speaker. But yet when you look at all the conversations that were had with, the, with, with Pharaoh by Moses, it seemed that Moses did all of the speaking. God gives other people talent and those people come along and they strengthen us along the way. The third thing that I've learned about starting strong or starting smart is this, is that we have to make the decision. We have to decide to make the change you need. You have to decide to do it and then you've got to make the change you need. And for some of us, that is attitudes. What attitudes do you need to change in your life? And for some of us, that's we have to change our environment. There are some friends in your life who you need to say goodbye to, that you need to say, I love you, but when I spend time with you, you bring me down. You don't build me up. And sometimes we can stop and say, but I've got to hang out with those people because they need me. But sometimes those people can deplete us so badly that we, for, that we forget and so, and so, so who we're meant to be. So I want to say to you, you know, make a decision today. Make a decision today to, to, to look, look forward based on your past, to make sure that you realise you're not alone, to make sure that you decide to, to do and to make the changes that you need to make. That broken relationship that hurts you, uh, it's behind you now. It can be behind you now. That mistake, that miscalculation that you made, it's behind you now. Those words you spoke that you wish you hadn't, or those words you wish you should have said, you should have said and you didn't, it's behind you now. Those opportunities that were lost are behind you now. The cruel things that have been said and done to you are behind you now. You have to make those decisions to step forward and to make the change from the place you are. That God took a man called Moses who had all of this history and he used him greatly. God can do the same with you. But whatever it is, we can live a different life. You can live a different life. And right now, my prayer is that as you listen and as we pray in a minute, that right now that you would hear the voice of God speaking to you in your heart as you begin this year. Start smart, everybody. Listen to God. Start smart. And listen to God at this point in your life. Lord Jesus, we come before you and we ask for your help. We ask for your help as we begin this new year. We ask, Lord God, that you would come into every one of us. Lord, we open our hands, our hearts to you. And we ask, Lord God, that you would come and you would speak to the centre of us, that you would guide us and lead us, that you would allow us to see you and to see opportunity, to look at our past and to realise it doesn't go away. But Lord God, it can be the very platform that launches us 
into our destiny, into the place where we are now, and to that destiny ultimately of heaven. Lord God, allow us to make changes in our life. Give us strength and courage. And more than even strength and courage, give us grace, the ability to do, so that this year we can truly say this has been the best year of our life. And Father, we make this prayer in the name of Jesus through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. As we launch into a new year, we all want to start strong. We want to make this a great year. Well, I've recently released a book called 90 Days of Renewal. And 90 Days of Renewal is about how do we step into the future in a fantastic way. And it's 90 days because it's long enough for us to be able to break habits from our past that sometimes have us captured in our life. I don't know about you, but I make New Year's resolutions and don't keep them very much because I don't do them long enough. Well, I wrote this book in such a way that you could read along, follow along, and it will help you make really great change in your life, but also give you new energy and renew you exactly in the place where you are. Well, I wanna make this book available to everybody. And so what we've done is we've made it the cost of the printing and the cost of the mail to everybody. And you, that's, if you need to take it for that amount, you can. But to everybody else, I would encourage you to go into our website, to go to this address on the screen, and you choose how much you wish to give. Because what the extra that you give will help us to get this to more people, to help more people all over the world. And I'm so grateful that so many people do, and they contribute far and above uh, the cost of the book in order that many other people will receive it. I pray that you'd really be greatly blessed with this today. Loving Father, I thank you today that you're with us. I pray, Lord God, that you would, would renew us, renew us in our actions and in our thoughts so that we would start strong this year, Lord God, and have the best year of our lives. And Father, we make this prayer in the name of Jesus through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, thank you, everybody. I pray that you'd be blessed wherever you are, that you would know that God is with you, that God is all around you, uh, wherever you are around the world. Hey, and as I say, don't forget, God is never far from you.